Firstly, we have the hand muscles. And don't obsess over the details of the hand muscles for step one, but you should know some basics. And so the basics are as follows. The phenar eminence is a group of muscles controlling the thumb. Okay, and this is this pad of muscle that sits just below your thumb. It's composed of opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and flexor pollicis brevis. So opponens, abductor, and flexor. So oppose for O, abduct is A, and flex is F, O-A-F spells out O, and that's how you can remember this. In the pinky, or the small fifth finger, we have the hypothenar eminence, and the hypothenar eminence is also composed of three muscles, the opponens digiti minimi, abductor digiti minimi, and flexor digiti minimi. Sound familiar? It is. It's exactly the same as the phenar eminence. Both are O-A-F, oppose, abduct, and flex. So it's easy to remember those two groups. The phenar eminence is controlled by the median nerve, and the hypothenar eminence is controlled by the ulnar nerve. Next, we have the dorsal and palmar interosseous muscles. Now, these sit in the palm or the dorsum of the hand, as the name implies, and they sit in between the different metacarpal bones. The dorsal interosseous muscles serve to abduct or abduct the fingers, whereas the palmar interosseous muscles serve to adduct or adduct the fingers. The way to remember this is through the mnemonic dab, pad, dab, D-A-B, dorsals abduct, and pad, P-A-D, palmers adduct, adduct. And lastly, we have the lumbrical muscles. These flex fingers at the MCP joint, and they extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. And in terms of innervation of all these muscles, both the dorsal and palmar interosseous muscles are supplied by the ulnar nerve. And for the lumbrical muscles, you should know that the third and the fourth lumbrical muscles, now these are the medial two of the lumbrical muscles, so we're talking about your pinky finger and your ring finger. These are controlled by the ulnar nerve. The other two lumbrical muscles, so the first and the second lumbrical muscles, which are going to be your lateral lumbrical muscles, so your index finger and your middle finger, these lumbrical muscles are actually controlled by the median nerve. So you don't have to obsess over these different muscles in the hand, but you should understand the innervation and the basic function of these muscles. Next, we're going to move on to the rotator cuff muscles. And the rotator cuff muscles are the shoulder muscles that are responsible for moving your shoulder in all different directions of rotation. They are remembered by the mnemonic device SITS, or SITS, and that stands for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Supraspinatus serves to abduct or abduct the arm, and it only does so for the first 10 or 15 degrees or so. And after that, the deltoid muscle takes over. But before the deltoid starts to act, those first few degrees of abduction are actually caused by a contraction of the supraspinatus muscle. Next, we have infraspinatus, which laterally rotates the arm, and teres minor, which also laterally rotates the arm. Very similar function between those two rotator cuff muscles. Teres minor also has a little bit of adduction of the arm, or adduction, but both infraspinatus and teres minor are big lateral rotators of the arm. And then lastly, we have subscapularis, which medially rotates the arm, and also does some adduction of the arm. The way to test the subscapularis and to think about its function is to put your hand behind your back and then try to push off away against your back, away from your body. That's sort of the function that subscapularis has. It's medial rotation. So, so far we've covered the hand muscles and the rotator cuff muscles. And now we're going to move on to some ligaments. In particular, we're going to talk about the knee ligaments first. Now, there are several important ones you can see, picture on your screen right now. On either side of the knee, you have the LCL and the MCL. And that stands for lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament. Now, the medial collateral ligament is going to attach the femur to the tibia on the medial side of the leg. And the LCL, or the lateral collateral ligament, is just going to connect 
the femur to the fibula on the lateral side of the knee. So medial collateral ligament, MCL, and the lateral collateral ligament, the LCL. Then inside the knee joint itself, you have two more. You have the ACL and the PCL. Now the ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament, and the PCL is the posterior cruciate ligament. These are important to remember exactly where their attachment sites are. Now, the anterior, or ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, is going to have one of its attachments on the lateral condyle of the femur, and its other is actually going to be on the anterior surface of the tibial plateau, and that's why we call it the anterior cruciate ligament. So its two attachments are on the anterior tibial plateau, as well as on the lateral condyle of the femur. So it's going anterior to lateral. And then the other one, the PCL, posterior cruciate ligament, as its name implies, is going to bind to the posterior portion of the tibial plateau. That's why it gets its name. But instead of going to the lateral condyle of the femur like the ACL did, it's actually going to go to the medial condyle of the femur. So we've got a go medial condyle of the femur to the posterior tibial plateau. That's the PCL. So, so far we've covered the MCL, the LCL, the ACL, and the PCL. Those are your four major ligaments of the knee. Now in the knee there's also something called the meniscus, and there's both a lateral and a medial meniscus. Now, the meniscus is a cartilaginous tissue that serves several roles. One is going to be to provide some structural integrity to the knee, so very similar to the ACL and the PCL, but it also serves to reduce friction at the knee joint, and also to sort of disperse the weight of the rest of the upper body as it sits on the knee to reduce damage to the knee joint over time, so it's sort of a cushion. Now, there are several important injury patterns you should recognize on step one with regard to the knee and its ligaments. A very common football injury occurs from a lateral force to the side of the body, so a player getting hit on the side of their leg, for example, and we call this the unhappy triad. And what this means is that you have damage to the medial collateral ligament, usually a sprain or a tear, also to the anterior cruciate ligament, or the ACL, and also to the lateral meniscus, not the medial, but the lateral meniscus. So MCL, ACL, and lateral meniscus is known as unhappy triad. It's a very commonly tested football injury. In order to tell if a patient has torn the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, there's a common physical exam sign you can test for, which is called an anterior drawer sign. And you basically grab onto the patient's leg, so you're talking about the shin or the calf below the, the, the knee joint, and while you're holding the femur stable, you pull that part of the lower leg forward towards you and away from the patient, so anterior to the patient. And if there's a lot of laxity in that motion, you call it a positive anterior drawer sign and you can be pretty sure that the patient has torn their anterior cruciate ligament. Likewise, if you try to passively abduct or adduct the leg at the knee joint, if you have a lot of passive abduction, so very, very easily abducted, you want to be concerned about a torn medial collateral ligament. And likewise, if you have a lot of passive adduction or adduction, you want to be concerned about an LCL, a lateral collateral ligament tear. So that covers the basic injuries to the knee, and we also should mention some repetitive elbow uh, injuries. And so these happen from ongoing repetitive damage to the elbow and its tendons. The most commonly tested here would be a lateral epicondylitis or a medial epicondylitis. And these are just like the knee. The elbow has lateral collateral ligaments and medial collateral ligaments that line the medial and lateral surfaces of the joint and these get damaged over time, secondary to repetitive injury. And so if it's on the lateral side, we call that tennis elbow, because it very commonly results from tennis. And if it's a medial epicondylitis, we call it a golfer's elbow, because this is very commonly seen as a repetitive golf injury.